They taunted Jesus on the cross, saying, Let us see if God will come and deliver him. It looked dark on that day of the crucifixion, but it was gloriously bright on the resurrection morning. It was still brighter and more joyous on the day of Pentecost. The religions of pessimistic despair seek to obtain release from the burdens of life. They crave extinction in endless slumber and rest. These are the religions of primitive fear and dread. The religion of Jesus is a new gospel of faith to be proclaimed to struggling humanity. This new religion is founded on faith, hope, and love. To Jesus, mortal life had dealt its hardest, cruelest, and bitterest blows, and this man met these ministrations of despair with faith, courage, and the unswerving determination to do his Father's will. Jesus met life in all its terrible reality and mastered it, even in death. He did not use religion as a release from life. The religion of Jesus does not seek to escape this life in order to enjoy the waiting bliss of another existence. The religion of Jesus provides the joy and peace of another and spiritual existence to enhance and ennoble the life which men now live in the flesh. If religion is an opiate to the people, it is not the religion of Jesus. On the cross he refused to drink the deadening drug, and his spirit, poured out upon all flesh, is a mighty world influence which leads man upward and urges him onward. The spiritual forward urge is the most powerful driving force present in this world. The truth-learning believer is the one progressive and aggressive soul on earth. On the day of Pentecost, the religion of Jesus broke all national restrictions and racial fetters. It is forever true, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. On this day, the Spirit of Truth became the personal gift from the Master to every mortal. This Spirit was bestowed for the purpose of qualifying believers more effectively to preach the gospel of the kingdom. But they mistook the experience of receiving the outpoured Spirit for a part of the new gospel which they were unconsciously formulating. Do not overlook the fact that the Spirit of Truth was bestowed upon all sincere believers. This gift of the Spirit did not come only to the Apostles. The one hundred and twenty men and women assembled in the upper chamber all received the new teacher, as did all the honest of heart throughout the whole world. This new teacher was bestowed upon mankind, and every soul received him in accordance with the love for truth and the capacity to grasp and comprehend spiritual realities. At last, True religion is delivered from the custody of priests and all sacred classes and finds its real manifestation in the individual souls of men. The religion of Jesus fosters the highest type of human civilization in that it creates the highest type of spiritual personality and proclaims the sacredness of that person. The coming of the Spirit of Truth on Pentecost made possible a religion which is neither radical nor conservative. It is neither the old nor the new. It is to be dominated neither by the old nor the young. The fact of Jesus' earthly life provides a fixed point for the anchor of time, while the bestowal of the Spirit of Truth provides for the everlasting expansion and endless growth of the religion which He lived and the gospel which He proclaimed. The Spirit guides into all truth. He is the teacher of an expanding and always growing religion of endless progress and divine unfolding. This new teacher will be forever unfolding to the truth-seeking believer that which was so divinely folded up in the person and nature of the Son of Man. The manifestations associated with the bestowal of the new teacher and the reception of the apostles' preaching by the men of various races and nations gathered together at Jerusalem indicate the universality of the religion of Jesus. The gospel of the kingdom was to be identified with no particular race, culture, or language. This day of Pentecost witnessed the great effort of the Spirit to liberate the religion of Jesus from its inherited Jewish fetters. Even after this demonstration of pouring out the Spirit upon all flesh, the apostles at first endeavored to impose the requirements of Judaism upon their converts. Even Paul had trouble with his Jerusalem brethren because he refused to subject the Gentiles to these Jewish practices. 
No revealed religion can spread to all the world when it makes the serious mistake of becoming permeated with some national culture or associated with established racial, social, or economic practices. The bestowal of the Spirit of Truth was independent of all forms, ceremonies, sacred places, and special behavior by those who received the fullness of its manifestation. When the Spirit came upon those assembled in the upper chamber, they were simply sitting there, having just been engaged in silent prayer. The Spirit was bestowed in the country as well as in the city. It was not necessary for the apostles to go apart to a lonely place for years of solitary meditation in order to receive the Spirit. For all time, Pentecost disassociates the idea of spiritual experience from the notion of especially favorable environments. Pentecost, with its spiritual endowment, was designed forever to loose the religion of the Master from all dependence upon physical force. The teachers of this new religion are now equipped with spiritual weapons. They are to go out to conquer the world with unfailing forgiveness, matchless goodwill, and abounding love. They are equipped to overcome evil with good, to vanquish hate by love, to destroy fear with a courageous and living faith in truth. Jesus had already taught his followers that his religion was never passive, Always were his disciples to be active and positive in their ministry of mercy and in their manifestations of love. No longer did these believers look upon Yahweh as the Lord of hosts. They now regarded the eternal deity as the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. They made that progress at least, even if they did in some measure fail fully to grasp the truth that God is also the spiritual father of every individual. Pentecost endowed mortal man with the power to forgive personal injuries, to keep sweet in the midst of the gravest injustice, to remain unmoved in the face of appalling danger, and to challenge the evils of hate and anger by the fearless acts of love and forbearance. Urantia has passed through the ravages of great and destructive wars in its history. All participants in these terrible struggles met with defeat. There was but one victor, there was only one who came out of these embittered struggles with an enhanced reputation. That was Jesus of Nazareth and his gospel of overcoming evil with good. The secret of a better civilization is bound up in the Master's teachings of the brotherhood of man, the goodwill of love and mutual trust. Up to Pentecost, religion had revealed only man seeking for God. Since Pentecost, man is still searching for God but there shines out over the world the spectacle of God also seeking for man and sending his spirit to dwell within him when he has found him. Before the teachings of Jesus which culminated in Pentecost, women had little or no spiritual standing in the tenets of the older religions. After Pentecost, in the brotherhood of the kingdom, woman stood before God on an equality with man. Among the 120 who received this special visitation of the Spirit were many of the women disciples, and they shared these blessings equally with the men believers. No longer can man presume to monopolize the ministry of religious service. The Pharisee might go on thanking God that he was not born a woman, a leper, or a Gentile, but among the followers of Jesus, woman has been forever set free from all religious discriminations based on sex. Pentecost obliterated all religious discrimination founded on racial distinction, cultural differences, social caste, or sex prejudice. No wonder these believers in the new religion would cry out, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Both the mother and brother of Jesus were present among the 120 believers, and as members of this common group of disciples, they also received the outpoured Spirit. They received no more of the good gift than did their fellows. No special gift was bestowed upon the members of Jesus' earthly family. Pentecost marked the end of special priesthoods and all belief in sacred families. Before Pentecost, the apostles had given up much for Jesus. They had sacrificed their homes, families, friends, worldly goods, and positions. At Pentecost, they gave themselves to God, and the Father and the Son responded, by giving themselves to man, sending their spirits to live within men. 
This experience of losing self and finding the spirit was not one of emotion. It was an act of intelligent self-surrender and unreserved consecration. Pentecost was the call to spiritual unity among gospel believers. When the Spirit descended on the disciples at Jerusalem, the same thing happened in Philadelphia, Alexandria, and at all other places where true believers dwelt. It was literally true that there was but one heart and soul among the multitude of the believers. The religion of Jesus is the most powerful unifying influence the world has ever known. Pentecost was designed to lessen the self-assertiveness of individuals, groups, nations, and races. It is this spirit of self-assertiveness which so increases in tension that it periodically breaks loose in destructive wars. Mankind can be unified only by the spiritual approach, and the spirit of truth is a world influence which is universal. The coming of the spirit of truth purifies the human heart and leads the recipient to formulate a life purpose single to the will of God and the welfare of men. The material spirit of selfishness has been swallowed up in this new spiritual bestowal of selflessness. Pentecost, then and now, signifies that the Jesus of history has become the divine son of living experience. The joy of this outpoured spirit, when it is consciously experienced in human life, is a tonic for health, a stimulus for mind, and an unfailing energy for the soul. Prayer did not bring the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, but it did have much to do with determining the capacity of receptivity which characterized the individual believers. Prayer does not move the divine heart to liberality of bestowal, but it does so often dig out larger and deeper channels wherein the divine bestowals may flow to the hearts and souls of those who thus remember to maintain unbroken communion with their Maker through sincere prayer and true worship.